Well, we continue to adore our living Savior by turning to God's holy word as we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5. We're going to be in verse 22 to the end of the chapter. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bible as well. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22 to the end of chapter 5. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and has still lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you and we will hear and do it. And the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always to fear me and to keep all my commandments that it may go well with them and with their descendants forever. Go and say to them, return to your tents, but you stand here by me and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statute and the rules that you shall teach them, that they may do them in the land that I am giving them to possess. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. Let's pray. God, thank you that you have grace for your people, that you lead your people. And thank you that while we know you, God, you don't consume us and kill us, but rather you give us life. And so today, as we turn to your word and we see who you are, God, thank you that you are a living God who who brings life, abundant life to his people. And so, Lord, as we listen to the word that you have given to Pastor Trent this week through Deuteronomy, God, I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive, ready to act, ready to listen, to do, and to obey, Lord. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For the commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, then you shall live. Therefore, choose life, for he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore fathers so that you and your offspring may live. In his book, The World of Ideas, Bill Moyers describes how an observer saw a launch of Apollo 17 back in 1975. This is the description of that experience. I want to read it for you. It was a night launch. There were hundreds of cynical reporters all over the town, drinking beer, wisecracking, waiting for this 35-story high rocket. The countdown came and then the launch. The first thing you see is this extraordinary orange light, which is just at the limit of what you can bear to look at. Everything is illuminated with this light. Then comes this thing slowly rising up in total silence because it takes a few seconds for the sound to come across. Then you hear a whoosh, and it enters right into you. You can practically hear jaws dropping. The sense of wonder fills everyone in the whole place as this thing goes up and up. The first stage ignites this beautiful blue flame. It becomes like a star, 
but then you realize there are humans in it. And then there's total silence. People just get up quietly, helping each other up. They're kind. They open doors. They look at one another, speaking quietly and interestedly. These were suddenly moral people because the sense of wonder, the experience of wonder, had made them moral. What he describes as a sense of wonder from watching a rocket launch into space is what the Bible might refer to as the fear of the Lord, which results from having a vision of the living God. When we read through the Bible and we see people encounter a vision of the Lord or, or he comes near to them in some particular way, it provokes a dramatic response in the people to whom he comes. When God speaks to Abraham in Genesis 15, Abraham falls on his face. When God speaks to Moses in Exodus 3, Moses takes off his shoes and he hides his face from the presence of the Lord in the burning bush. When God appears to Isaiah in the temple in all of his glory, Isaiah cries out, woe is me for I am undone. And so likewise here, when God appears to his people at Horeb or Mount Sinai, same place, and delivers to them the Ten Commandments, it provokes a dramatic response in them. And this is not accidental. This is intentional. Moses records back in Deuteronomy chapter 4 that the Lord said to him, Gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth and that they may teach their children to do so. God wants them to come to the mountain where he can speak to them and they can learn to fear and for their children who maybe aren't there present, he wants them to pass it on to the next generation, this fear of the Lord. Why does God want his people to fear him? Well, in the Exodus account of these events, we learn in Exodus 20, 20, Moses says to the people after God has revealed himself to them, he says, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, literally upon your faces, that you may not sin. God wants his people to fear him so that his people may not sin. Godly fear is an effective deterrent to his people sinning. And yet, for many of us, the fear of the Lord, the fear of God, feels like a relic of a bygone era. And that feels like something appropriate for people living in the Old Testament, or maybe even people living in Puritan New England, but what does the fear of the Lord have to do with me? A.W. Tozer observed all the way back in 1961 this very lack in the church of his day when he says, the self-assurance of modern Christians, the basic levity present in so many of our religious gatherings, the shocking disrespect shown for the person of God are evidence enough of blindness of heart. Many call themselves by the name of Christ, talk much about God and pray to him sometimes, but evidently do not know who he is. Evidently, by watching and observing, it is evident that many Christians do not know who God is. This is not just a problem in 1961. It was not just a problem in the days of Moses. It's not just a modern problem. This has been a problem for the people of God from the very beginning. And as I studied this theme of fear of the Lord this week, I realized that this is something that's been quite apart even from my own experience of God. I have seasons of having a clear vision of who God really is, and then I have seasons where I'm in the fog and I forget what it means when we sing holy, holy, holy. 
And my life is poor for not having this clear sense of what it means to fear the Lord. So this morning, we're gonna talk about the fear of the Lord because that's what the passage is about. And we're gonna look at it under three headings, the source of godly fear, the wisdom of godly fear, and finally, the resolution of godly fear. So looking with me first at the source of godly fear, we pick up in verse 22 where we left off last week. God has delivered to his people the Ten Commandments, and then we read, These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man. And man still live. It's hard for us to imagine an experience like that. To have heard somebody speak and we come away shocked that we're still alive. I want you to hear God that way. I want to hear God that way. The Holy One who, who condescends to speak to his people, but we're so aware and so cognizant of his holiness that we say, I can't believe I heard him and I'm living to tell about it. He's so much greater. So much grandeur, his glory and his majesty are so far beyond our, our reckoning, and yet we've heard him and lived. I can't imagine the shock of this, but picture this people. They were slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh's whip for nearly 400 years. God rescues them in these dramatic displays of power and might. And then he brings them through this craggy, desolate wasteland of a desert. And he brings them to this mountain. And, and in a place that's not ordinarily cloudy, these clouds of thick darkness roll down upon this mountaintop. And the mountain is on fire, at least appears to be on fire, because the presence of the Lord is there. And then out from the fire speaks a voice that Exodus tells us sounds like a trumpet sounding. What's happening here? What's happening here is what theologians call a theophany, made up of two Greek words that mean God and showing or God revealing. A theophany is a manifestation of God's presence. And we find a number of these throughout the scriptures. And scholars who have studied this have found that there are nine elements common to God revealing himself in the scriptures. We're not going to walk through all nine, but I just want to share with you six of them because it will not only help us to understand what's happening in this passage, but it will also help us understand other theophanies where God reveals himself in a particular way to his people through the Bible. So here are six of the common elements of a theophany. The first is divine initiation. Whenever God reveals himself to people, it is always his own initiative. People cannot get God to show himself to them. This is different than a lot of ancient Near Eastern peoples understood their gods to be. If you remember Elijah's encounter with the prophets of Baal, they felt that by cutting themselves and bleeding out before their God, they could get him to reveal himself, but they couldn't. Because, of course, Baal is no God. But the God of Israel, when he reveals himself to his people, he does so because he chooses to condescend to show us himself and something of his glory. It's always by divine initiation. The scriptures themselves are a gift of God's grace to us. We could not discover anything about who God is except he reveals himself through creation and even more so through the word and the person of Jesus Christ. But that's grace. That's a gift not deserved. 
Secondly, when God reveals himself, there is an impartation of holiness. So when God descends on, on Mount Sinai and the fire and the cloud and the smoke, what's happening there is, is God is not only present in some way, but he imparts his holiness to that place. And so in Exodus, when God descends to the mountain, he tells Moses, do not let anybody come and touch this mountain. Because God's presence there sanctified the place. It's now holy. And if they were to touch it, they had to die. God's presence in the Ark of the Covenant was so thick that when Uzzah reached up to stop it from falling, he drops dead because of the holiness of God imparted to that ark. In Exodus 3, when God appears to Moses in the burning bush, he says to Moses, take off your shoes because the place you're standing is holy ground. Why? Because I'm there. Because God is present there and the place is sanctified. Now think about this. The holy God has come to dwell inside of you. He has sanctified you. He has imparted his holiness to you so that you are the temple of the living God. You are holy because God dwells within you. When God reveals himself, there is an impartation of holiness to that place or object. Thirdly, when God reveals himself, there is both revelation and concealment at the same time. Because God is holy and because we are sinful, God cannot reveal himself fully to us in all his glory. So even when he does condescend to show us something of himself, he must still conceal himself from us lest we die. Moses prayed, God, show me your glory. And God says, essentially, you don't know what you're asking. But let me put you in this rock and cover your face. And when I pass by, I'll let you see my backside. Because that's all you can handle. When God reveals himself on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is there burning in brilliant glory, and God the Father speaks, which is revelation, but he speaks from a cloud, which is, again, concealment, because the people cannot handle it. Amazingly, when we follow the story of Jesus, there are some moments where what is concealed breaks through and is revealed at a higher level. When he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and the soldiers come with Judas to arrest him and Jesus says to them, I can't say it without crying because it's just amazing. But he says, who are you seeking? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And then <laughs> this is what happens. When Jesus said to them, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. Because what was concealed was just a little bit more revealed. And they responded like people revealed when they've seen the Lord. They fall back in fear. That leads to the fourth piece. When God reveals himself, there's an evocation of human fear. An evocation of human fear. So... Again, God appears to Abraham. Abraham falls on his face. He appears to, to, uh, to Moses. Moses hides his face. He appears to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. And this is what we read. I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. They didn't even see the vision, but they were aware of the presence. And it caused them to run and hide. And Daniel, of course, is flat on his face in the presence of God. When God reveals himself, it evokes fear. When, when God appears to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he falls down. And the people around him tremble with fear, even though they don't see the vision themselves. God's revealing of himself to people evokes a trembling. 
Jeffrey Newhouse writes, humans can only respond in awe and fear, not because of their humanity, but because of their fallen nature, even in the presence of the God who saves them. He is the God who saves, and yet when he reveals himself to us, we cannot but tremble in awe. Fifthly, when God reveals himself, there's an occasion of natural upheaval, an occasion of natural upheaval. So he appears to them at Horeb, and they have this sound like a trumpet. There's this fire. There's this cloud. There's an earthquake that shakes the mountain. When Elijah is at the same mountain in 1 Kings, Mount Sinai, or Horeb here, he Uh, God reveals himself to him, and there's this mighty rushing wind that is so strong, it breaks rocks. I had to read that again this week, because I was like, what kind of wind breaks rocks? But that's the, the manifestation of God's presence and power, breaks rocks with wind, and then there's an earthquake, and then there's fire that appears to Elijah disturbs the natural order. When you read through the Psalms and the prophets and there's these, uh, these longings or reflections on God appearing to his people, there's frequently described along with it, trees doing strange things and mountains quaking and hills running and all you know, deer giving birth because God speaks. These kinds of natural disruptions because of the presence of the Lord. In that light, Think again about Acts chapter two where we read, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. When God manifests himself, there is this rushing wind and these tongues of fire appearing Sixthly, when God reveals himself, there is a verbal revelation. The, the, the sights and sounds are tremendous, and they leave an impact and an impression, but they serve to set up a verbal revelation. This is how God reveals himself to us, is primarily through speaking. And so at Mount Horeb, the, the point was to not only impress them with his presence and instill fear in them, but so that they would listen and do what he said. Likewise, if we think to the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus is transfigured before the disciples, there's this amazing display of his brilliance. There's the cloud. There's the voice speaking from the cloud. But the point is the message that's spoken that interprets the significance of the event. And this is what the voice says from the cloud. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The point of the theophany was the message, listen to Jesus. As we follow Jesus' life and we come to the end, Jesus goes up on Calvary. There he dies on a cross. There are some tremendous natural disruptions as God is revealing something of himself there at Calvary. There's darkness over the land at midday. There's an earthquake that shakes And there's also a verbal revelation from an unlikely source. Here's how we read it in Matthew 27. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. The point was the message that came through the very ones who crucified him. Truly this was the Son of God. So again, when we come to the revelation here at Horeb, the point is that his people might fear him and walk in all of the commandments that he's given to them and that Moses is going to give to them. And it should leave that impression not only on that generation, but on their children. Now, this is the source of godly fear. God himself is the source of godly fear. That's all well and good for the people of Israel. They got to go out on this hiking trip to the mountain. They got to camp out. They got to see fire and the mountain and smoke and hear this great voice like a trumpet. And, you know, Daniel got to see a vision of God in the temple. Ezekiel got to see God. Isaiah got to see God. Saul got to see the risen Jesus. 
You know, that's great for all of them, but what about me? God, show yourself to me. What's interesting about that prayer is that nobody who's seen him that I can remember or find asked to experience it again. <laughs> there is something about the presence that is so dramatic, so transformative, and so terrifying that once they've experienced it, there's not a request necessarily to do it the same thing. Rather, what we find is, as in this passage, a command. We don't have to see God manifest himself personally to us as he did to his people through the ages. In fact, we're even in a more privileged position because what we possess is the entirety of the scriptures, God's fullest revelation of himself written for us in words, unchanging, always true, faithful and reliable witness to what the living God is really like, including the visions he gave people of himself, the revelation of himself through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have the more perfect revelation right here. And we are invited to come and see, behold his majesty and his glory and his goodness and his power. You can even look at it on your phone. And it's through his word and by his spirit that godly fear is imparted to us. Let's look secondly at the wisdom of godly fear. Continuing in verse 24, verse 25. Now, therefore, why should we die? Remember, they said, this day we've seen God and we're still alive. Verse 25. Now, therefore, why should we die now? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and has still lived? In other words, we, we, we feel like we've gotten lucky. We made it through this revelation, but let's not test our luck by having him speak any more to us. We can't take it and we don't want it. That was enough. And so they say that they want somebody else to listen to him for them. What is it that, that provoked this experience? And what is it about God speaking to them that caused them to say, no more? I think it's this, that to see or hear something of God is to see and hear something of his holiness. And exposure to his holiness exposes our sinfulness. To experience God in his holiness is to show you more clearly than you've ever seen before your own sinfulness. And those two things together, the extraordinary holiness of God that you did not before comprehend and the extraordinary sinfulness of your own person, to see those two things at the same time provokes a strong response of, this is not good. I don't want any more of this. It's too much. That's the wisdom of godly fear. When we see that God is holy and that we are not, and there is a significant gap between his holiness and our sinfulness, and we say, that's too much. That's godly wisdom. That's the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. When Isaiah had a vision of God in the temple, we read this in Isaiah 6, the foundations of the threshold shook 
at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When he saw God as he is, he saw himself as he is, and it filled him with woe. And he cried out for mercy, and he knew he needed someone to deal with his sin. That he could not fix this gap between God's holiness and his own sin. And an angel came and mediated between him and God. Well, here the people of Israel are aware of the gap between God's holiness and their sinfulness, and they ask for a mediator. And they say in verse 27, go near to Moses and hear all that the Lord our God will say and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you and we will hear and do it. We're good here, Moses. You go up to the mountain, listen to what God has to say. You come back and tell us and we'll just do what he says. <laughs> How does God respond to this? You think, is God going to be ticked off that they, here he is, condescending to reveal himself to these people, and, and now they're saying, no, nope, we're good. Moses, you come back and tell us what he said. How's God going to feel about that? I love this. Verse 28, he says, the Lord spoke, the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you, and they are right in all that they have spoken. They're absolutely right. They can't handle me. And then verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always. To fear me and to keep all my commandments that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. They're absolutely right. The gap between me and them is so far, they cannot handle my presence like this. And oh, that they recognize this reality always. Listen to that longing in God's heart, verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart as this, always to fear me and to keep my commandments, that they could see so clearly forever, like they're seeing right now, just what I'm like and what they're like, because then they would walk in my ways. But the longing indicates an unfulfilled desire because, of course, God knows the hearts of his people. Here they are shaking in their boots at the mountain, fearing him as they ought to, saying, we need a mediator between you and us because it's too much. And Exodus tells us Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days to get the rest of the law, and meanwhile, the people make an idol. It was barely a month. And so also our experiences of God. We come on Sunday morning, we have this tremendous awareness of God's holiness and the gap between us, and we find ourselves delighting in him. And yes, Lord, just tell me, I'll do all that you say. And, you know, by next Sunday, we're like, what? something happened here last week. What was that? Such is the nature of our hearts. But it is God's grace to us to show us that gap between his holiness and our sinfulness and to teach us that we too need a mediator. This is the wisdom of godly fear to make us understand that we cannot deal with God on our own. We need a go-between him and us. John Newton wrote in that beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." When you recognize for the first time that God is holy and you are not, that is God's grace to you. Because it leads you to look for a mediator, an answer to the problem of your sin, and God has provided that answer. But this fear of the Lord can grow in one of two ways, one of which is good and one of which is not so good. 
The fear of the Lord, this awareness of the gap between God's holiness and our sinfulness can develop in an unhelpful way when it drives us away from the Lord rather than to him. Sometimes we become aware that God is holy and we are not, and the effect is that we try harder to be holy and we try harder to be righteous and we try hard to live up to the standards of his law so that, so that we don't have to run from him in fear. But what happens is, we, if we, when we're honest with ourselves, we never can measure up. And every time we're confronted with the word and someone tells it to us plain, we have to recognize that we still don't measure up to what he called us to. And I thought I was being good and moral, but I see that it goes far deeper than what I'm doing on the surface. I don't measure up. And if you keep trying to measure up, you will find yourself increasingly resenting God for his holiness, even hating him. And this was the experience of the great reformer Martin Luther when he was a monk. He understood the holiness and righteousness of God. He wanted to be righteous. He tried hard every day to do all the right things, all kinds of penance. He confessed his sins for hours and hours on end, just trying to be good enough, righteous enough for God. And he said, at the end of it, I realized I didn't love God. I hated him. And so it will be if your fear of the Lord drives you away from him to try and measure up and be good enough for him. So what is the right way? Where does godly wisdom lead? What's the right way to fear the Lord? What's the resolution of the fear of the Lord where fear actually drives us to him instead of away from him? Well, that's what we look at here in this third point, the resolution of godly fear. When we recognize that gap, we can try to measure up ourselves, but it's ultimately gonna drive us away. Or we can, like the Israelites, say, I need a mediator. I can't get myself there. I need someone to go between God and myself. And then, in that moment, recognize that God has provided for us a mediator. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the God-man. He is the only one who can could mediate between God and man because he is God and man. And what the scripture says is that he is holy. He is without sin. He alone can bear to hear the voice of God. He alone can bear the presence of God. He alone dwelt in the presence of God as God for all eternity past. And the scripture says that through his death, ultimately, he has served to reconcile us between God and man. But let me show you in the terms of this text how that works. Remember in Exodus chapter 19, God told Moses to go down and come up bringing Aaron with you, but don't let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. That's the mountain. Don't let them come to the mountain where I am because I will break out against them because they're sinful. We're also told in Exodus that the people stood far off while Moses, the mediator, drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And there, Moses meets with God and God gives him the law. Well, as we read the story of Jesus in the Gospels, at the end of Jesus' life, he also ascends a hill. And at that hill, it is surrounded in darkness in the middle of the day. And there Jesus goes up to stand before the Lord in all of his holiness and righteousness. The same Lord who gave the law at Mount Sinai now is above Calvary. And there Jesus, the only one to have perfectly kept God's law all along the way, takes up the cross bearing our sin and our guilt for all of our law breaking. And he approaches the thick darkness of the holy mountain of the Lord. You can understand why his sweat was like drops of blood, knowing what he was approaching and who. And there at the cross, Jesus bearing our sin is exposed to the full holiness of God and God breaks out against him and his wrath and judgment against our sin at the cross. 
Jesus bears the full weight of the holiness of God expressed through judgment with the effect that our sin is atoned for and our guilt is taken away. And so that the scripture can now invite us to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Why can we draw near to God? Because our sin has been paid for. We have been declared holy. His very presence now dwells within us. And we have been reconciled to him through the death of Jesus upon the cross. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. That same grace that taught me to be afraid and to look for a mediator is the grace that provided Jesus Christ to be the satisfaction for my sin so that I can actually have a relationship with God, the holy God, even though I yet still sin. And so we rejoice with trembling. We rejoice that we have been reconciled, but we tremble because he is still the holy God. Jonathan Edwards says, herein is the difference between the fear of a godly man and the fear of a sinner. The sinner fears the effects of God's displeasure. The godly person fears his displeasure itself. Before we come to Jesus and see him take away our sin and bear the judgment and condemnation we deserved, we are afraid of the consequences of our sin. But once we see Jesus has dealt with all of those, that's no longer what motivates our obedience. What motivates our obedience is our love for God and that we do not want to displease him because we love him. What's driving you this morning? What view of God is driving your desire to walk in his ways? Fear of hell or fear of displeasing the one who sought you and bought you with his redeeming blood? The fear of God, Thomas Watson says, the fear of God and the love of God work best in conjunction. The love of God is like a wind in our sails that moves our souls forward and the fear of God like a ballast that keeps us steady in the way. Fear and love come together at the cross for God's people. If you feel the fear of God and you recognize the gap between his holiness and your sinfulness and you are tired of trying to live up to it. And you're tired of running and, and fleeing from his presence and cringing when you hear his word and his law spoken. Here's what you need to do. You need to hide from God in God. You need to hide from God in God. He has provided in himself a refuge from the wrath and judgment that is coming for sin. And it's in Jesus. So run to Jesus. Don't wait. Run to him. 